Good afternoon, everyone. Today is July 16th, and I am going to be talking about the findings from the assignment that the Lord gave me on the 14th. I am going to reread the 14th because when I was reading it, I was interjecting and trying to buffer things, and my flesh was warring against the words, so I'm just going to read it through again, and it's short, and then I'll, I'll read the one from yesterday. I did try to make this video yesterday. We had a, I know I promised to deliver yesterday, and we had a family reunion, and then I came out, and it got dark again, and it just didn't seem ready yet. The Lord still had more to teach me and he did this morning. So I guess that was sort of a practice and I'm just trusting he's holding it all in his hands and I'm not going to, to worry about that. So, but I do apologize for those of you that, you know, are waiting for that. So on the 14th, remember I woke up and I had the words ninth hour, sixth seal, the day has come, family host and welcome home first thing uh, while I was laying in bed and then I got up and journaled those things and, and received these words from the Lord. You can look back at the 14th and see the scripture that was with, was with this assignment. My child, write these words. You will show them the days are here, but moments away. Tell them I have spoken these words into your awareness. My child, do not fear the days to come. Do not wonder how this will all take place. You will begin to see that all I have said is true. You will wonder at the nature of these events. You will tell many about the truth of what is occurring. You will grow in faith and stature. You will deliver masses. You will show them I am the Lord, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You will continue to speak, but it will be in a new capacity. You will grow into a mighty warrior, and you will show them the days have been written since the beginning of time. You will begin this work soon, daughter. It is all happening very, very soon. Listen to me. I am speaking. It is me. Listen closely. Write this down. You are going to deliver this message today. You are going to bring people to their knees. You are going to show them the way to me is short. You are going to begin this work now. You will find time to visit with me more often. You will hear me more clearly. You will figure this out, Melissa. You will see the big picture. You will find the answers and you will be able to speak them. Listen, daughter, I need you to find the way to the cross. Find the way to the tabernacle. Find the way to deliverance. Find out what this means today. Search the scriptures and check with me. Begin this task. I love you, my child. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Now begin. And then yesterday I received this. So this is from July 15th. Daughter, friend, you are going to begin today by pressing into the lesson I gave you yesterday. Begin to develop your thoughts and check in with me before you make the video. Show them I have given you this assignment in order that they may see. They will be able to recognize my design in this. They will see the details and begin to follow me to the cross. Melissa, listen daughter, stop wandering. I am doing this work so that all may know. I am the Lord. I was, I am, and I am coming. The whole earth will know. Soon, very soon. I love you, my children. I am your father. I am yours and you are mine. Stay close to me. Do not fear. I am your Abba, your daddy. I am not going to leave you or forsake you. You are my children. Will I not protect you? Will I not do what I have promised? Cling to my skirts. Hold on to my hand. Keep your eyes on me. Listen for me. I am going to carry you. I'm going to carry you through. Trust, rest, abide. All will be well, my children. It is already finished. I am already at the end waiting. Do not fear tomorrow. Abide in me today. These moments together are crucial. Learn to rest. Learn to trust. I am Creator God and I have spoken. Go to them today, Melissa. Deliver these words and the lesson. I love you, my child. Get going. I said, okay, Lord, thank you. And the scripture that went with that, Romans 5, 2, 1 Peter 2, 4, Malachi 3, 4, 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 6, Revelation 2, 14, Hebrews 8, 2, Galatians 3, 6, Song of Solomon 2, 14, Mark 5, 8, Philippians 3, 4, Deuteronomy 6, 8, Lamentation 2, 
Lamentations 2, 6. And then I hear the words rest and trust. And in this message, he talked about clinging to my skirts. And I paused it there because that sounded very strange to me. It sounded feminine. It sounded motherly. And I was a little concerned about that. And then I remembered a while back, um, last year sometime. Yeah, I think it was last year. And I, I had done a study on the tallit. And the tallit is the prayer shawl. And there's been some loss of meaning in our translation because all of the translations I think some of them do say skirts whenever they're talking about the garments that were worn by the priests and the the rabbis and the Jewish leaders and um, just the the Jews so a lot of the translations have changed it to to garments the hem of the garment and I think maybe King James says skirts so the prayer shawl, the tallit, actually has, a, I mean, I'm sure a lot of you know this, but has really s deep significance in the Jewish faith. So in the Old Testament, for example, Saul, when he had the corner ripped off, that, that signified him kind of losing his anointing. And uh, there's a place where the, the hem of the skirt was thrown over a person in order to establish a covenant and Jesus used his own tallit prayer shawl when he healed the girl when she uh, when she when she rose from the dead the he threw his prayer shawl over her and said in the Bible it says Talithia rise up and that means girl under the tallit get up the woman who was bleeding touched the tassel on his prayer shawl, which she, it seems, understood the deep meaning of that tassel that actually represented that Jesus was the Messiah. And he said, who touched me? So he knew her faith and she, he knew that she understood who he was. And at the cross, when they cast lots for his, for his clothing, I'm sure it was for the tallit that they didn't want that cut up, but to, to keep it in one piece. So I thought it was interesting when he said, will I not do what I have promised? And then he said, cling to my skirts. So it's, it's a promise and a covenant. So cling to my promises. He says, hold my hand. His hand is holding us. Hold the hand that is holding us. Keep your eyes on me. He's, he's watching us so carefully. Look back at the eyes that are watching us so carefully. Those are some of the thoughts that I had, that I had there. So on this assignment, he said to find the way to the cross, find the way to the tabernacle, and find the way to deliverance. So I'm going to use the order that he gave me and begin to talk about these things. It's I had to move my chair a little bit because the sun was starting to shine on me. Somebody said that they wanted to see my dog, Minnie. So she's sitting right here. This is Minnie. Minnie smooches. <laughs> Smooch la pooch because she's French. Okay, so the assignment. He, I'm going to follow the order that he gave me. He said, find the way to the cross. Find the way to the tabernacle and find the way to deliverance. And when I began this assignment, I thought of the Via Della Rosa, I thought of the way of the cross that the Catholics, they practice that around Easter and the different stations. Uh, I just recently learned about that. So those were some of the things on my mind. So I was kind of journeying down the road and experiencing the different characters along the way thinking deeply about Simon Peter, how he was just so sure he would never deny Christ and he was ready to kill for him. He was ready to do anything, give up his life for Jesus. And then when the heat was on, he became a coward and he denied Jesus three times, just like Jesus predicted. Uh, Judas traded him for money, traded his loyalty and his heart was more, more concerned about financial gain. Um, 
pilot. He thought he was innocent and he really didn't want, he wanted to set him free, but not bad enough to extend himself to, you know, push back against the Jews. So he handed him over. The Jews were just so threatened that somebody would challenge their beliefs, their belief system, and the lifestyle that they had. Jesus said things that just offended them so deeply that they were ready to kill him because they didn't want to shift, shift their way of thinking and believing. They couldn't recognize him as, as the Messiah they were waiting for. And then we have the Marys who were at the cross as well as the disciple that he loved. We have the Simon who was, didn't know Jesus, but carried his cross. I was just thinking about the deep meanings of some of these things. How many people don't have a personal intimate relationship with the Lord yet carry his cross? And that struck me. I'd, I'd never seen that before. I was looking at Old Testament prophecies that were fulfilled in Isaiah and Psalms. I'll put some of those in the notes because it's just amazing and it just validates the Bible so much that thousands of years before Jesus came, it described exactly what would be happening. The lamb led to the slaughter. And so I had a couple pages of notes of things that I was thinking about and researching and the Lord said to check in with him and I did. And he said, no, you're not on the right path. And I was like, really? <laughs> and I was like, oh, and uh, I felt like I was never going to get it right. So I asked for help and, and he did. He steered me correctly. But I think some of those things were still valuable. And um, I still gained a lot just, you know, through through that exercise of thinking about the characters and putting myself in the scene again. But the path that he wanted to take me on was, so I'm going to start with the journey to the cross with Jesus. And it begins, he showed me, at the water baptism. So John said that there would be one who, he, John baptized in, in water, but there was going to be one who baptized in spirit and in truth, and uh, in spirit and in fire. And when Jesus was baptized in water, the heavens opened and the spirit descended and rested on him and a voice from heaven said this is my son in whom i am well pleased and at that point jesus began his ministry he began to his journey to the cross he began his journey to his to fulfill his purpose and god's will for his life and he began to disciple men and train them, the twelve. He began healing people and delivering them. He began softening hearts and shifting people's mindset and delivering them from their religion. He delivered people from demons and he rose people people were healed from sickness but he also raised people from the dead he made dead things come to life and then the night before he was crucified he's he his flesh you know it was painful it was painful but he said Lord thy will be done and he surrendered to the Lord's will and then he carried his cross and he was whipped and his beard was torn out and he was spit on and he didn't look away he was accused and he didn't defend himself he he was like a, a lamb going to the slaughter just silently and on the cross the the thief you know he said to the thief that believed who he was he said that he would see him in heaven 
later that day. And Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Before he gave up his spirit. And I've come to believe that that was more of how Jesus works. You know, he always has, there's always more with Jesus. There's what appears to be on the surface, but there's a hidden truth. And that hidden truth, I believe, is he was pointing people to the scriptures of Psalm 22 that says, that says those very words. And when you read on, you discover that the Lord, the Father, did not forsake his son. And then Jesus gave up his spirit, and when he did, the heavens, again, there was, um, you know, the sky went dark, and the veil tore in the, in the temple. And Jesus was buried, and he, he rose. When he, was, when he died, he actually went to hell. And he took the keys from Satan. Satan had the keys over death. And Jesus took them. He conquered death. He conquered Satan. He defeated the grave. And he also, then he uh, appeared to Mary. And Mary tried to touch him. And he said, don't touch me. I haven't yet ascended to the Father. Well, I believe Jesus went into heaven and atoned the altar there with his blood. Because in hell there was a holding place called the Abraham's bosom because the original sin was with Satan when he he rebelled against God and he was kicked out of heaven so sin was introduced into heaven and Jesus everything he did at the cross his blood it's everything and so the the people who were held in Abraham's bosom and there's scripture for all of this and I'll put it put it in the notes then they went to heaven and so did the thief on the cross so in a way that was the first first fruits a shadow a pattern and then he came back in his glorified body after after his purpose was fulfilled he came back in his glorified body and he appeared to the disciples who still didn't understand everything. But he promised them. He promised them the Holy Spirit. They, they wouldn't be left as orphans. And that the Holy Spirit would come. And if he didn't do these things, then the Holy Spirit wouldn't be able to come. And that they would be able to do even greater things than he did. And then, after he left, there was a period of time... And then Pentecost happened and the Spirit fell. And once the Spirit fell, the church was born. And the disciples began to live out their, their purpose. So that's the journey to the cross. I do want to mention, maybe here before we move on, that everything has such deep meaning and layers and it's all tied together and when you look when you look at scripture and you start to see all of this woven throughout all the patterns and the circles and the same story retold over and over you start to see how great our God is how it is absolutely true that he is the author and finisher of faith, that he's the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega, that he stands outside of time. And it's already finished. We have to live out our salvation experience. We have to live out our Deuter Deuteronomy and Exodus experience in this world. But he stands outside of time and he appoints people to different times and seasons and places he puts the people, places, and things, and he has created this beautiful tapestry and this beautiful story. And he searched hearts. He searches hearts. And he's here with us now, but he's also outside of time, and he, he already appointed the things. And we have to live them out and work out our salvation experience in this realm, this realm that's separate from him that he holds. 
this realm of time. But it's impossible to see him any other way because it was all part of the script. There's a story. The end's already written. We can read about it. And so, for ex example, you know, the first, and I want to talk about Satan when he was kicked out of heaven. He introduced the original, the original sin into heaven and, and that had to be atoned. And Adam and Eve sinned and they got kicked out of the garden. And Jesus already, you know, God already had a plan. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Nothing was made um, without Him. Jesus was there in the beginning, and His name was Word. And that Word became flesh, and He dwelt among us. He had a plan for our salvation. He had a plan to restore us to the Father from the beginning of time. And it's a love story. The greatest love story ever told. So in the garden... Adam, he sinned and he, he lost the presence of God and everything that Adam lost, Jesus has restored. So what Adam lost to the tree, Jesus hung on that tree and he restored it. He, because of what he did, he as a free gift offered life in heaven blood is spiritual currency you know everything that we have here on earth is a shadow of what already exists in the heavenlies it's it's we have a holy god it's judicial it's um you know there's there's currency the the blood currency something had to be done to atone and jesus paid our fine he paid the fine we are all born under the sin curse because, because of Adam. We are all sons of Adam. And we're born in this earth that was cursed. And Jesus is God in the flesh that came. And he atoned and paid the price so that we could be restored back to the presence of heaven, of Jesus, of God, the Father. So we could again experience the presence of our Creator. And that's what, when the veil was torn, it represented that the barrier, the sin barrier, what was sin, he converted to mercy. Okay, now we're going to find the way to the tabernacle. And in order to do that, we have to go back to Moses. And in the Old Testament, they experience things in the physical that we experience in the spiritual. And so hidden in all of those stories are spiritual truths and spiritual directives, kind of. Um, they show order, the order of things. So see if you can see it. Moses is a type of Jesus. See if you can see the story. Jesus didn't have a salvation story, but we started with Jesus. Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. And so he, he has a different story than we do because he, was, he didn't need salvation. But Moses was a type of Jesus, and he led the Israelites out of their, their bondage and slavery to Egypt and um took them on a journey to the promised land. And so that's kind of their salvation experience is when they left Egypt. And the next thing that they did is they came to the sea and they walked through the sea, which is kind of the water baptism. On the other side of the parted sea was the cloud of smoke by day and pillar of fire at night. Remember, Jesus was going to baptize in, in spirit and in fire. So that represents the Holy Spirit guiding them as they journeyed. Two separate baptisms. And then they began their, their journey to the Promised Land. And along the way, the, we get the Ark of the Covenant, 
we get the Ten Commandments that are put inside of there and we get the Ten Commandments first and we get the um, the manna and those types of things and the manna the the Ten Commandments and the staff of Aaron are put in the Ark of the Covenant and Moses receives directions on how to build a tabernacle and he anoints the priests and things like that as the Israelites are traveling the Ark of the Covenant which holds the presence of God it was a place where the presence of God could dwell often leads leads the the nation the body it is the head they conquer lands and territories and at night when they rest each tribe rests under his banner and they form the shape of a cross and at the heart in the center are the Levites and that's where the Ark of the Covenant rests right at the heart and the the cross the way that the the Israelites camped um, on the east side was Judah and the banner was a lion which is a constellation in the sky on the Maseroth and there's 12 tribes and there's 12 constellations on the east side was Judah which was a lion that was on the banner on the north side was Dan and that was an eagle on the south side across from that was Reuben and that was a man and across from Judah on the west side was the bull Ephraim you could look up pictures of that if you want to see well on the veil in the tabernacle those four symbols were on the veil in the sky the veil that is the sky that separates the second and third heaven the outer space one that's a veil over us and that has the same on, on the constellations the lion is opposite the bull and the eagle is opposite the man just like they camped so when Jesus came he he stated that he was the way the truth and the life and if you were a, in the Jewish culture and religion if you were a Jew of that time that would have been very offensive because he was saying to them that he is the tabernacle because in rabbinical tradition the outer court was called the way the holy place was called the truth and the holy of holies was called the life so Jesus was saying that he was all of it so we're gonna walk through now the tabernacle and see how that that's true so in Jesus is the narrow way he is the gate that allows us to even enter into the outer court and that's our salvation experience the Holy Spirit baptizes us in Jesus we can't even take credit for our faith the Holy Spirit is the one who who readies hearts to receive and who creates hearts of, of flesh and a place where a seed can be planted and, and can grow and so we are baptized by the Holy Spirit in Jesus when we walk into the tabernacle into the outer court the tabernacle we talked about how the camp is shaped when they when they stopped and camped at night or or camped you know when they weren't traveling we talked that about if you were to look at it from an aerial view you would see a cross well the tabernacle itself in the center of the camp is also shaped as a cross and as soon as you enter into that narrow gate there was a cross shaped altar where the sin sacrifices were made the atoning sacrifices and so the bull the lamb the different animals that were were sacrificed there so Jesus is all of those things he he paid our he atoned for for all of it all the sins and so once we get into 
the tabernacle, Jesus' atonement puts us in the right position with God, in a perfect position because we stand under the blood of Jesus. It covers us. So it puts us in right standing with our Creator God. There's nothing we can do except receive and believe and have faith. And that's, that's counted to us as righteousness. And we are clothed in His righteousness. So the furniture in the tabernacle is very simple. The, and when he says back to the basics, this is what I'm thinking. It's, it's very basic. The next piece of furniture is the, the laver and the water where the priests, after they would do the blood sacrifice, would wash themselves. So that is the, the water baptism. And then the next piece of furniture, the next station, is the, the flask of oil, the oil anointing. And that is the Holy Spirit, baptism of the Holy Spirit baptism in the Holy Spirit. And what happened when when people did not follow the our God is a God of order. What happened back then when people didn't follow the order and they they did things out of order and they just entered into the holy of holies or into the holy place. Many of them died. Or if they just came into the presence or touched the presence without going through the proper procedures, they died. And this, this is a, an area maybe we'll talk more about, but the, the next place that you enter is the holy place, and this has a covering over it. And in the holy place, there's a menorah candle. It's a seven-part seven candle. There's the incense, and there's the showbread table. This is like the training. This is where the seven, the menorah represents the seven spirits. Some people, you know, think it represents the church and maybe it does also, you know, can have more than one meaning. So this could be seen as the church. So it could be seen as the church. The incense could be the worship and the prayers of the church and the bread could be the communion that the church experiences together. I'm going to talk about uh, um, just if the tabernacle lives inside of me. If I am the tabernacle now and you are the tabernacle now. Those candles, the menorah candle, represents the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits. Spirit of wisdom, spirit of the Lord, spirit of understanding, spirit of counsel, Spirit of power, spirit of knowledge, spirit, spirit of fear of the Lord. Those are the seven spirits. The incense represents our worship in spirit and in truth. So it's, it's, it's pure. It's led by the spirit. It is free of the flesh because our spirit is now alive and we've been anointed and given the Holy Spirit. And so now we can worship in spirit and in truth. And the bread represents our training, spending time with the bread of life, which is, which is Jesus himself. And as we grow in faith, we start to really understand that it's all grace, that there is no striving, there is no, I know some of you don't like that, but there's nothing that we can do to earn it. Okay, we, we do live out our faith with fear and trembling, and we do live out our salvation experience, but we know and we rest in the grace and the gift, and we yield to God's individual and perfect will for our life. And I want to talk about that for a moment, the good, pleasing, and perfect will. I believe that the good will is salvation. Once you are inside, once you enter in through the narrow way, which is Jesus, once you get in there, nothing can take you out of his hand. Okay, you're safe. You have experienced salvation. You can't, well, I don't want to go into all that, but nothing can pluck you out of the Father's hand. That's a promise that he says. And then there's, you know, water baptism where, where we die to old self and, be, and rise in 
um, in Jesus. We die with him and we live with him. So we, we die to the flesh and, and we're resurrected in Christ. So the Holy Spirit baptized us in Jesus. We have Jesus living inside of us. And we are in, in a perfect position before our Creator God. But the Holy Spirit baptism, we can't enter the holy place without it. And if we do, it's, it's out of, it's not pleasing to Him. He's got an order. So I, I believe it's not, it's not to the fault of people sometimes because they aren't trained in this. I wasn't trained in it. I didn't know. We try to live out our purpose without receiving our anointing. And so we're doing it out of our own, our own understanding and not the Spirit's leading. And so... That's where our journey to the cross begins. It begins with our anointing because that is where we receive our, our purpose in that. So I think the good will is that we're saved. We're safe, okay? The pleasing will is that we're anointed. And the perfect will is when we yield to that anointing and actually fulfill the purpose that the Lord gave us. It is true that many people do not live out the perfect will of the Father and they do not arrive in the Holy of Holies. Jesus prayed that we'd become one. So the Ark of the Covenant is kind of a symbol of, of oneness, of unity, of becoming bone of his bones and flesh of his flesh, living in the spirit of truth. The Ark of the Covenant is made out of two things. It represents Jesus. Uh, the acacia wood represents Jesus as man, and then the gold represents Jesus glorified. Um, his, 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 the God aspect of him. And inside of that, it's kind of like our heart the dwelling place. The laws, loving him and loving others. The manna, totally reliant on him for everything he wants. Manna is hard to explain what that was exactly, but it was sustenance. It was what kept them alive. It was life. The way, the truth, the life. It was life. It kept them alive. And that's who God wants us to he wants to be that for us. He is that for us, but he wants to be recognized as that. Everything that we have, life, is, is because of him. And all that we are and all that we experience and all that we have, it's him. And then the rod of Aaron in there is interesting. Jesus performed, once he was anointed, once he had his Holy Spirit anointing and he was on his way to the cross, he performed miracles. That staff was used to perform miracles. So it's the power. Also, I learned that, you know, the shepherds used to mark their staff every time that the Lord would show up. It's kind of a record and a memory stored in the heart. But I think it more in this, in this case represents the power and and so that was the dwelling place and that was kind of the head when they were when they were received their marching orders and they were traveling that led the way doesn't the Lord ask us to be one body under under the head of Christ a dwelling place where the Holy Spirit can live and I think it's really, really important to understand the order. Our God is a God of order and to see time and time again that that order is spelled out for us and, and we've missed it as a, as a body. And I'm just going to point out one more place. Um, 
some of this teaching I've learned in the past from Robert Morris. He does a really good explanation of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he talks about how Paul wrote a third of the Bible. And we know, we talked in a previous video recently, that Paul was trained by Jesus himself in spirit. And he knew so much. I mean, we still don't really understand all the things that Paul says. He, his, his understanding and the revelation that he received is, I think, unmatched. And there was things that he still couldn't even tell us because it was just too weighty and too heavy, things that he understood. And he said, so when, when after Pentecost, people would come to him, and I'll put scripture in there, in there for this, he said, they were believers, they'd been water baptized, he said, have you been baptized in the Holy Spirit? And some of them said, we didn't even know there was a baptism of the Holy Spirit. And he laid hands on them and baptized them in the Holy Spirit. They received at that moment the Holy Spirit and everything that comes with the Holy Spirit, which is all the gifts. So a lot of Christians believe that the Holy Spirit is given to them. The Holy Spirit does work in our hearts and baptizes us in Jesus. Jesus baptizes us in the Holy Spirit and he that is what he desires to do. But for my own self and my own personal journey, I had to be like the disciples. I had to go through a period of time of learning with Jesus first. I had to learn some things and understand some things before the opportunity came for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that it's like that for everybody, but that seems to be the pattern also for them. And so there's, you know, some of you are are worried you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, maybe that is his will and his pleasing will for everybody. That's what he wants for everybody. But he doesn't force it on anybody and he wants it to be understood and he wants it to be understood correctly. And he desires that we be engaged in that process, that we desire it and understand it. So that's just something to chew on. Now let's go to deliverance. So Jesus delivered us from the law and all of the things that had to be done at the tabernacle. He was all of it. He was the atoning blood for all of it. Once a year the priests would go in and they would atone all the places and they had to do things just so um, Jesus, Jesus became the atoning blood. He became the priest. He became all of it. Everything in there is fulfilled in Jesus. All the requirements. Jesus' work is not complete. It's finished. Okay? It's finished. But we are still living it out. And we have not yet received full deliverance. In the tabernacle, there was animal skins placed over the holy place and a blue cloth. They represent veils. Our flesh is sort of a veil. We still have to live in this flesh, in this time dimension, in this physical realm. And the blue cloth, you know, is, is kind of the, the, the blanket over, over us. It's the veil over us in the heavenlies, I, I believe. Is what he's showing me and so when we receive our final deliverance experience it's been a process of deliverance right and it comes full circle back to the Garden of Eden when we are delivered back to the original design and we live in glorified bodies free of this physical realm and we are 100% face-to-face -face with our Creator and able to able to survive there, you know, because we still live under this veil of, of separation where we can't really hold all that He is because it's dangerous for us. So when the veil is torn, when that veil is torn and the, and the supernatural and the spiritual is, is seen, 
and experienced and when we are delivered from from this this veil of flesh and the veil that separates us from the third heaven then we will receive our full deliverance I don't know exactly how that's gonna look but this is what I'm imagining based on kind of the order of things once we become the body that the spirit dwells in that body the spirit goes and a new thing happens I think after the bride goes then there's going to be revival and there's things get real supernatural and that's gonna be like Pentecost again as we prepare the the like when the church was being built it's it's a, it's a shadow of the kingdom the New Jerusalem that's gonna to come to the earth and so Jesus is gonna come back in in fullness and splendor and the New Jerusalem is established and eventually we get like the new heaven and the new earth and you know a lot of times so then we go back to the story about how Abraham's bosom was a holding place heaven is a holding place for humans in their glorified state to then come to the new earth that is our final destination that is our 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 deliverance is when the we are restored to the original design we were supposed we were made for for earth but like Adam and Eve and so when the veil is torn that last time that last veil we're almost there you know that last veil is torn then we get to be delivered completely and the story is finished and um, he, he said that this whole earthly experience is our Deuteronomy and our Exodus experience he's pre been preparing us for our Exodus to be delivered to the promised land the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem, the new kingdom. And everything here right now is just a shadow of that, of things that already exist in the heavenlies, but and things to come. So that was the assignment. And I, I, please, Lord, if there's anything else I need to say, please bring it to mind. But um, I hope that blessed you in some way. It certainly blessed me. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to try to put that, and practice speaking some of that it, it wasn't perfect I know it's far from perfect there's a lot of work to do but um, this is part of training it's part of training for me it's part of training for you and uh, thank you Lord for being such a great teacher thank you Holy Spirit for the revelation thank you for the promises thank you for being such an awesome like the, just the lengths that you've gone to tell the story and to deliver us is just beautiful. And we just thank you for being our savior and our creator and our father, our sustainer, our deliverer. So remember the, the, the assignment was to find the way to the cross, find the way to the tabernacle, find the way to deliverance. He said in yesterday's message, they will see the details and begin to follow me to the cross. So I hope you see the order of things and what he's asking and what he's desiring and what his good, pleasing, and perfect will is for our lives. I'm going to uh, stop the video for a moment and just kind of look over my notes and see if there's anything huge that I've left out. And then I'm going to wrap it up. Okay, there were a couple important things that I did miss. Circumcision. So circumcision in the Old and New Testament was something that identified people as Israelites, as Jews, as set apart, as belonging to God, the creator of the world, the one true God. And Jesus did away with the law, but replaced that with circumcision of the heart 
So what that means is a heart that is willing to be humble and receive truth, a place where seeds can grow, a heart that loves what God loves and desires what God desires. That is now the symbol and the, the thing that sets his children apart. We talked a little bit about doctrines of man and the order of the, the tabernacle. So we talked about how it's common to go right from water baptism or belief and try to get right into the holy place and the holy of holies. And in the Old Testament, that was a no-no. There was an order of things and it was very dangerous and, and deadly to, to step out of that order or do things that, that the Lord did not set into place, an order that he did not set into place. So when people stepped out of that will, um, it was dangerous. So what happens is we've got all of these different doctrines of man and it's, it's like being tossed around in the ocean. You know, it's, it's, it's unstable. It's, do I believe this or do I believe that? And everything I hear, uh, sounds like truth and uh, which one is true. And Jesus spoke in parables and his disciples, they didn't even understand what he was saying because he was speaking to people that would have ears. And the only way we have ears is when we get our Holy Spirit baptism. That is where we can hear truth and, and receive things of the Spirit. And so I believe that that's where a lot of the conf confusion comes from. And in heaven, that sea is like a sea of glass. It's solid. It is a resting place. There's no more tossing to and fro. When you have the spirit of truth living in you, you have ears to hear and you can discern and you have the Holy Spirit residing in you. So that was something that was, uh, I think, important to mention. <laughs> Finally, there's one more live tomorrow, the 17th at 3 p.m. You can find it on Seek Heavenly Things. It's not gonna be like the last live. I don't believe everyone's gonna be speaking. I don't think I'm going to be speaking unless the Lord tells me to, but he's been having me work on this assignment. Uh, but I do think it's going to be a, a wonderful time of discovery and revelation. So I hope you can be there. We'll see what he do, what, what he does with these, with these lives. Um, again, I don't know that it's, it's for this time or, or after we're gone. I don't know what the big picture plan is, but I know he knows and he's holding it and it's, it's exciting to be alive right now and to be held by him and to be led by him and i just want to thank you all for being here today with me and i will look forward to seeing you in the next video to see where he takes us next and i love you and i hope you have a, a wonderful sunday god bless you